Good afternoon. Super delighted to be here with you today, part of this uh, great community. My name is Peter Steyart, so it is a weird last name to pronounce, so forgive you, William. Um, I am an artist and a transdisciplinary researcher, and I'm focusing right now uh, mainly on building art and science connections within the field of astronomy and then specifically exoplanets. But today I'm not talking about exoplanets. Uh, however, the story that I want to share is space related. I want to talk about interactions between art and science, um, not only about the machine learning um, aspect that we intertwined with our art project, but also um, just shortly touch upon uh, the biology uh, interactions that we had and uh, engineering. So I'm uh, going to provide some insights in one specific project that is still very much in development. So it's absolutely not a finished project. And Touch Designer has been proven for us crucial uh, to give us insight in the complex data um, that we've been using and also to shape um, the graphics and the sculptures that are part of the project. So my, my goal is not only to show you um, the route to success or the pathways that has proven successful or so where we are right now, but also sometimes just uh, showcase other experiments that, that proved to fail uh, along the way, all within the scope of this single project. Okay, let's jump back in time to the 5th of December in 2019. Times were clearly a lot simpler than they are right now. Um, I was watching a YouTube stream and I was very moved. Uh, in fact, I think it was the most profound uh, moment so far in my uh, career as an artist. Because on board of this Falcon space rocket that you can see were many scientific experimental modules, which would be used by the astronauts aboard the International Space Station to conduct tests. But the reason um, why I was so moved is because one of those mon modules carried active uh, uh, life forms and a series of visual artworks um, that were created by myself and the team um, that, that is working together with me um, on this project. Mm. The life forms that were aboard that I that I just referred to are called rotifers. So rotifers are extremely fascinating creatures, and there's absolutely no time here to discuss all of those characteristics that make them uh, extraordinary right here. But I want to share just a few uh, a few of those characteristics that prove to be um, yeah crucial for the artwork that we're building uh, that results from the experiments. So to start, uh, rotifers only exist as female. They're, therefore, they produce offspring by means of cloning. They're also extremely old as a species um, and have been around on the planet for over 50 million years. So that means that they are an evolutionary speaking um, successful formula. Um, however, that again is hard to reconcile uh, with asexual reproduction uh, because for most life forms, sexual uh, selection is your driving force behind your biological evolution. Furthermore, they are super resilient. Um, some of these rotifer animals uh, that have been found in the permafrost that have been uh, stored there for 20,000 years have been, restored, have been restored and they just sprung back to life. And in fact, they are even capable to restore broken DNA. So um, when one of these animals or a collection of these animals find itself in a situation where there is no water, um, they, they die, they break down until cellular level, uh, including their DNA. And when you reintroduce water, they can restore that and come back to life and reassemble their DNA. Um, however, with slight modifications, errors or adoptions that happened along the way. And so one of the theories is that this might be the driving force behind, um, behind evolution, behind its evolution. Um, and that is so alien and so powerful and, and therefore a prime candidate for um, a wide range of scientific experiments, including um, for uh, space science. The team that is working on the scientific aspect of this is uh, Dal of Karin van Donink, uh, professor at Unamur, uh, in, in uh, one city here in the south of Belgium, and uh, will be a university in Brussels in Belgium. And she invited artists to join one of these experiments, which would take uh, aboard of the International Space Station. And um, <clears throat> one of the artists that she invited was our uh, transdisciplinary collective. They're called SEATS, Space Ecologies Art and Design. 
And um, we have a whole bunch of members uh, in our network uh, working in different fields from arts and sciences and engineering to activism. And we combine these approaches in general for most of the projects to reshape uh, future thinking through a series of, of, um, of projects. And when we were invited by um, Catherine, by Karine, we, <clears throat> we asked within our network, within our collective who wanted to join, uh, we set up a, a team. These are the people you can see there uh, on the slides. And we agreed that we would set up a bidirectional conversation with the scientists working on it. Um, and we as a transdisciplinary art group, we would go in dialogue with the scientists working on the Rotifer project and vice versa. Most of this work has been developed during the pandemic. Um, and so most of the collaboration happened remotely and um, for the majority of the time I was working on this project I was living in Manila under a strict military enforced lockdown and um, <laughs> I tried to maintain my sanity at the time uh, during the long time I was there by by programming and designing and collaborating with the other team members specifically on this project then before we go into what we did technically I want to just touch uh, note on, on, on the conceptualization of the project. And this stems for, of, from the characteristics of the roti fur animals that I just talked about uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, so the name of the project that we conceptualize is Engines of Eternity. And it starts with that concept of DNA repair and cloning and immortality as departure points for uh, an evolving collaborative art installation. In order to reflect on, on the question of humanity's obsession um, with creating a perfect static society um, that is immune to change. The core of this project is an artwork that travels between Earth and outer space by means of the International Space Station and then gradually transform the process by impact of the space environment. And then space is basically invited as a creative agent and the work develops through co-creation between these biological organisms, the humans working on the project, technology, and then uh, the space environment. So that is the conceptualization. But then here is uh, what's happening in practice. Uh, this was a challenge that we had. We had one square centimeter, just some minor empty space on the labels of the experimental bags that were sent up to the ISS uh, that we could make use of. And on top of that, we could only make use of standard issue Sharpie markers, which have a very uh, broad uh, tipping point. So um, it was quite a challenge. Um, also hard to combine it up with, with like, it's something like generative graphics, um, what, what my role is in the team or what I'm focusing on. Um, but what we wanted to create was an initial code that we wanted to send up in space and let that evolve every time we did an experiment in space in the ISS uh, when it would return to Earth. Um, so we needed some kind of seed uh, that to send up uh, with 10 unique identifiers. And what we came up with as a unique identifier um, was basically to cut out a stencil, which was uh, uh, designed both to reflect uh, as an infinity symbol and DNA uh, symbol. And Angelo, um, our team leads, would attach uh, the symbol onto the backs and using Sharpie uh, uh, ink uh, on his finger, he would be able to make 10 uh, unique identifiers. Um, so we had our first launch in 2019, then uh, when they came back, we had to wait for some time for the data to be analyzed uh, by the scientists, but I'll come back on that. And then we started the experiments. And then we had a second launch in uh, December 2020. Um, and uh, now uh, we're still uh, waiting for a third launch, which would happen uh, probably in 2024 uh, and working on that data. Um, so here's like uh, the overall idea that we had. We created unique identifiers as a source code, um, which evolves over time based on the data coming from the Rotifers uh, in their space environments. And the second challenge that we have is uh, we want to translate those 2D graphics into uh, 3D sculptures as well. And we used uh, Touch Designer quite extensively, uh, but not uh, exclusively uh, for both uh, processes. Just some impressions on what that looked like. You can see the application of the original source code to the rocket uh, launching and then the team that was responsible for it and one of the identifiers. 
as well. Here you can see for both missions, uh, two astronauts who were handling uh, the, the modules uh, that contained the artwork and, uh, but of course also the scientific modules uh, because they're uh, attached to each other. And um, so when the experiment finished, we got our bags, they were sent off to the lab and after a few months we got the data and this is where, um, uh, where we're starting with our data analysis uh, and at some point machine learning becomes a crucial part of that, but not in the beginning. Um, I'll try to keep this short, uh, but go through the process anyway. We have 10 bags that were sent to the ISS, 10 bags with the rotifers, so the living animals that stayed on Earth as a control group. This is just, you know, your basic scientific methods situation. What we get back is um, the expression data. Um, um, I'll come back in a second what expression data is. We, but we only check for four flight bags and four ground bags as a baseline to check whether something, um, so some bias was introduced or something was going wrong. And um, the expression data is basically what we captured by sequencing is being captured by sequencing RNA. And so uh, this varies depending on what is expressed by the enzymes um, in the populations of the rotifers of each bag. This is expressed in something called FOSQ files. Um, and so that way we can figure out the differences, basically what happened on the ground and the impact from space towards what happened on the International Space Station. We used a whole bunch of standard tools and Python libraries um, in order to get uh, the expression and the variance for each uh, location. Uh, for and that for each bag, the expression of the enzymes. Um, so what we then do is we calculated the response as a difference for the expression and the average of all the ground bags. So that way we know how much each bag that was up in space differs basically from um, the average normal, let's say, or control situation uh, based on the animals living on, uh, on Earth. Um, however, and I'll come back in a second on this, uh, this, this doesn't tell us too much. The rotifer genome is not entirely sequenced or it's hard to find out what every of those enzymes means. And we use machine learning basically in order to solve that for us in order to introduce more hierarchy. Um, we want to focus a bit more right now on the visual explorations that we did. Um, so we, like I said, we used Touch Designer uh, a lot and it was a crucial uh, tool. It was the first time that I used Touch Designer. I, um, I have a background in graphic design um, and um, I, I, when I was studying there um, in my undergrads as part of my fine arts uh, degree, I realized that I had a passion for interactivity and I started with Quartz Composer, uh, which I think quite some people might remember. Absolutely fell in love with, with the power uh, that I felt at the time when exploring the tool like that. And then later on, I, I, yeah, I, I worked with a lot of different tools and, and programming languages and even uh, came up with some pseudo node based programming languages myself to make my work. Um, and then I always need an excuse to get started with Touch Designer and this was a great, uh, a great excuse and has been an absolutely amazing learning curve. But also it was one of the tools that we had in our tool chain. Uh, we're do not doing real machine learning, for example, inside Touch Designer, but we're doing that using external libraries and tools um, and here is a short overview of uh, both the scientific and, and creative tools that we use uh, for the next stages of this project. <clears throat> so while we're doing our bioinformatics analysis that I just uh, talked about, we also start to explore visually uh, how to evolve uh, our original codes. And like I said, the challenge is twofold. One, to evolve the 2D graphics based on the space data. So that space becomes a creative agent and also to uh, translate the 2D graphics into a sculpture, into a 3D mesh. Um, um, I'll just jump through some slides that shows you path uh, of, of this abandoned project, basically this abandoned uh, experiments within this project um, when we were trying to develop the visual code. Uh, most of this is, was done also uh, in Touch Designer. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, but not everything. Uh, so we have a lot of members working in the team, as, as, as you saw, and everybody uses their different tools. Uh, some also use analog approaches, such as Arise, one, who is uh, a very gifted sketch artist. Um, and was also contributing and building towards shared uh, visual language. Uh, that would be part of, of this project. Renderings of how it would look like in, 
when we actually can exhibit it, which will hopefully happen next year in April. Uh, and work uh, by Jeroen, another team member, um, in, I think this is processing, um, but maybe in Splendor, can't really remember, or a combination. Um, not only were we conducting the research on the visual language, but also using the bioinformatics data that we got, um, and so the difference between expression data on the enzyme level, um, I started to build a series of touch designer sketches in order to explore the characteristics and the composition of these data sets. Uh, which was uh, yeah a lot of fun. So this one had nothing to do with like how it would look like visually, but just trying to find patterns and interesting hooks uh, in order to evolve um, the graphics. Um, so and one of the first experiments that we did into transforming 2D graphics into a 3D sculpture for this project, um, we came up with this strategy, uh, which we decided not to pursue. Uh, and it's basically using a, whole, a series of GLSL shaders and some top uh, instancing in Touch Designer in order to um, yeah, in order to create the translation. But, but so this was not used. And so we decided that we needed to do first more work on our informatics. Uh, the data that we currently have was too flat, which result in a bit often arbitrary visualizations. And we wanted to introduce a higher order of, um, of hierarchy, basically. So we designed a quite experimental approach uh, to analyze function groups of the expressive data. I'm just going to jump over the next few slides and then explain the concept behind it after I reach the final one of these uh, slightly more technical ones. Ding. So what we actually wanted to do is to get a sense of what these proteins that we have the data of, what they do. We want to have like a functional annotation. Um, and so when we get a protein and we get our protein sequence, we try to match it with known proteins um, of other animals or, or living things. So we don't really have the information for this specific animal, for the rotifer, uh, because it's just not available yet. But we do have um, information um, using existing libraries um, um, of other living creatures and living things. So what we try to do is, given each protein, we try to match its description and we try to find similar protein descriptions uh, by defining basically uh, a distance between, the, between those descriptions. And this is where we use the machine learning for. Uh, we calculated the distance between each pair of proteins uh, using their, their description. And we could represent that then as a network where each node is again a protein and the edge is a link between those proteins and the edge weights are given by uh, these match uh, descriptions between the proteins. Then we apply like a community detection algorithm. Um, in this case, we use the Leiden algorithm um, because we wanted to maximize uh, modularity. And in short, what this means is that we made use of trained libraries of existing known proteins and try to match that up with the proteins of the rotifers that looked similar uh, in order to group the proteins together that have somewhat related functions. And so this is highly experimental. Is it solid science? I would say no. But it gives like um, it gives um, it, it helped us to push a bit further and faster in order to come up with non arbitrary hierarchy because we could uh, see basically what functional uh, clusters uh, so the characteristics of the of the rotifers would have the highest impact, for example, because that's what we wanted to use to evolve our code again. We want the code, of course, to evolve in. Uh, in a way that reflects the changes that happened up in space. To make this entire a lot more clear, muscle memory movement, for example, enzymes, uh, proteins that are linked with that, uh, of obviously had uh, a lot of changes based on the control group of Earth because they were living in weightlessness on the International Space Station. But not only did we know that already, or we, we, we thought we knew, but now we could also prove it uh, using our machine learning and experimental clustering algorithm. This is then how we actually do uh, both the evolution um, and uh, also uh, the translation. So these two things happen here simultaneously. We use the machine learning driven functional clustering of the proteins in order to evolve the original code into a new one. 
and we slice up the original and evolved codes using computer vision um, inside uh, the designer now um, to transform this into a 3D mesh. Uh, most of this was achieved by using a Python controlled replicator sketch and computer vision manipulations uh, using edge detection and blob detection and hair finders. Um, in, uh, in different Python sketches, which outputs then a single mesh. And every slice along the way can also be manually adjusted in order to achieve a desired structural and visual output when transforming the original 2D code into a three-dimensional uh, sculpture. Uh, here you can see how that evolution then looked. There's on four places because remember we had four bags. Uh, so we sent the 10 original code fragments up in space and using data from the packs relating to four of those fragments, we evolved the piece. After reassembling and refragmenting, we sent 16 new pieces of code up alongside 16 uh, new modules for a second test up at the International Space Station. Um, here you can see the application to uh, the second uh, test modules. Um, again, super limited amount of space uh, for the evolved code. And then I want to end uh, basically because also I see my time is running out with um, some um, some more graphics of how that looked uh, visually when we're conducting um, yeah the algorithms that I just explained. So this is all directly screenshots from inside uh, Touch Designer while we were trying to develop the translation algorithms. Um, yeah, also, you know, like I said, my first project, so playing around with the camera a lot and yeah, being amazed, trying uh, my first materials, which obviously is very rudimentary here. But after a while, uh, this is a result of, of, of one of the original codes. It's not yet perfect, uh, but we're getting at least a bit closer. Here is an overview of all of the 10 bags uh, in its original shape translated. And this is all of them stitched together and modeled into the infinity sign, which is a study of how we present it uh, as a large scale sculpture. Like I said, hopefully next year in April when we showcase a project. On the left, it's not ideal because it's a flat 2D graphic, but on the left here you can see the original and on the right you can see the evolved version based on that machine learning clustering algorithm based on the Rotifer data from when they were up in space. And uh, we haven't built, built the sculpture yet, but we've created a, a series of 3D prints in order to prepare ourselves right now for the final installation, which hopefully happens then uh, next year in April. And so that's a summary of where we are. Uh, we had two space missions, one with the original codes and its translation into a 3D mesh, and one with the evolved codes based on the machine learning of the Rotifer data, which is translated into a 3D mesh as well. And now we're waiting for the data of that second mission in order to make a second evolution. So a third version, and then there's a final flight scheduled in 2024. And then we can hopefully make our third and final um, evolution and fourth sculpture as well. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for the opportunity to present here, uh, to present to all of you. Um, I'll be hanging around, as BDM said, uh, after uh, the talk as well, and um, to answer any of the questions that you have. Uh, but if you want to find out more about the project uh, and the other projects that we do, um, you can find us on the website that is here presented on the screen. Thank you so much. So I'm going to introduce another project that uh, uses Star Designer also as one of the tools, but not the main tool. Um, and it's uh, my master project that I did uh, as a collaboration between uh, Zurich University, uh, University of Arts and Media Technology Center at ETH, uh, Technical University of Zurich. Um, so that was a master project of myself and Alessia Pataniela. Uh, who did study computer science at uh, ETH. And uh, we kind of uh, found that our interests uh, really match each other's and also kind of skills are on the opposite spectrum. Uh, so it was really a great start for this collaboration. And um, thanks to uh, like a great support from, from the ETH doctors, also from uh, the doctors from um, and, and teachers from my side, uh, this became something tangible in the end and it turned out to be this audiovisual um, installation. Uh, so maybe now I have first a very short trailer uh, so you get an idea of what it actually is in the first place and then I will explain uh, how it works and how it was achieved.
One shuffle of the voice message is enough to generate your virtual and make it more effortless to fabricate a world unique to your own and personal experience. I don't feel like doing much today. Just stroll around, hang out, eat and sleep over and over again. Mm -hmm. So this project has really a lot to do with the defects, and I hope that you are familiar with this topic. And but defects are um, synthesized generated videos where you basically take a face from one person and map it on uh, a source video. So in my case, what I really wanted to achieve, I wanted to give the audience um, the possibility to actually experience their alter egos. And it was based on this um, system uh, that first take, uh, took the, the Linux machine that was running Flask. Uh, so it's a Python for web, uh, framework for uh, web-based um, applications. And it was communicating uh, with JavaScript to create this uh, interaction, uh, interaction, interactive interface for the users to uh, be able to answer some questions. Um, then a picture of uh, their faces was taken. Uh, they had to pre-read uh, short text um, in order to get a uh, voice sample. And based on those three outputs, I, um, I took some of the uh, sentences, pre-recorded sentences, and decided to um, kind of play, um, give the user the opportunity to see the alternative or the opposite version of themselves. Um, so how it was working, the whole system, uh, on this one machine that was, a, uh, that was running on Linux, it was actually doing the, all the, ba the backend, so it was rendering the deepfakes, both the, both the video and the audio. Um, then it was communicating with the web browser and another uh, Windows machine via the local network that was running the designer. And the touch designer was uh, getting the JSON data from the website and outputting all of the deep fakes and the animation before uh, to the three different uh, beamers um, and speakers as well. Um, so this is just a, uh, the Flask uh, side of it and uh, that it's written in Python. So it's actually really uh, neat because you can uh, utilize it also directly in Touch Designer since uh, it's also running on Python. And um, so how it actually works, you are able to execute all of the um, CMD comments from uh, directly from within your computer. You can communicate also with the Touch Designer via JSON um, uh, that it's actually host, uh, hosted somewhere on the local network. Um, so like that, uh, you are able to actually uh, have maybe multiple machines in the same uh, in the same space that actually uh, divide the task. So in this case, one was rendering the deepfakes and another one was uh, displaying them on the, on the different beamers. Um, so first of all about the interface, this is exactly where the whole machine learning uh, happens in the background. Um, so it was uh, really a very simple um, uh, Interface was for first, it was just this test that it's actually based on the ocean test, or another name for it is a big five personality trait. And maybe some of you know, know that because of uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, they also use that uh, for um, when they manage to um, kind of get over a lot of people from social media, mostly Facebook, and vote um, and make them vote for Donald Trump. Uh, because this test uh, was actually embedded in a lot of different quizzes at that time. Um, so depending on the, whatever answer you gave, uh, they could actually really decode if uh, you were actually more uh, right-oriented or left-oriented. So I kind of found it very fascinated um, and realized that this is one of the uh, psychological models that exists there from the 60s already. And it gives uh, some sort of a superficial but already uh, quite a verbal description of human traits. Uh, and as you can see, there's this openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Uh, so there are different questions that you can find online. And um, it was an easy way for me to find out if I'm uh, actually dealing here with the participants that are more uh, introvert and extrovert and so on. Um, then the next part was just a video. So uh, you had to look into the camera. And uh, there was actually happening uh, already the first part inside of Touch Designer. Um, so this is where the deepfakes already started to happen. First of all, um, the video was taken uh, that lasted about three seconds. 
Um, and based on the different frames, I was running this best post, uh, best post algorithm um, in the background um, that was actually based on uh, face alignment GitHub um, page, and it was running within uh, the touch designer. Uh, so based on this source frame from the video, um, it kind of tried to find the find the best uh, frame from uh, from the whole video, uh, and then match this uh, this face on the face of a of a source video. So in this case, uh, you see I'm the target, and there is a source that was an extra actress from uh, from my university, uh, with whom I recorded different um, sentences. And this whole deep faking is actually happening with um, the retrained uh, first order model network. And it was actually really great because we managed to achieve uh, about one and a half seconds uh, per one frame uh, of original video rendering time. Uh, and then for the enhancement uh, part of the defects, uh, DFDNet was used. Um, so this was a little bit longer. It took about 10 seconds, but it allowed us to put the videos already in a 2K resolution instead of uh, 512 by uh, 512 uh, one that is coming from the first order model. Uh, so already you see here what's happening. Uh, the, the first row are just the original videos, and then the second one this is already the, the deep fake, and that was happening within. Um, per 10 seconds of a video we actually managed to get all of the videos within about one minute of a time plus additionally the audio um, maybe important to mention as well that um, i am was running uh, uh, linux on 2080 titanium card uh, so not really using the newest uh, generation of nvidia cards so i guess nowadays it probably uh, maybe with the implementation of the newer model that would already be uh, much much faster um, then, um, in order actually to get to uh, do the facial recognition, I was also using Touch Designer. Uh, on the left side, uh, you see also a friend of mine. Uh, so this is something that is running already within uh, uh, the Touch Designer. This was uh, to actually find out uh, the different uh, vertices on the inside of a face, on top of a face, and be able to uh, find out if a person in the video um, is actually smiling, uh, has the eyes open, because it was very important with this first uh, order model to have the first frame uh, as closely matching the, the original face, the original frame from the from the video as possible, and um, on the. JavaScript on the web uh, site based, I was using MediaPipe, which is a Google open source um, solution for um, uh, OpenCV for uh, uh, computer vision. So it's actually really great because it's running very, very fast. And as you see, this is something that I did yesterday in the train. Um, and as I said, already outputting the face mesh. And by measuring the distance between the different vertices, you can already tell uh, if someone has, for example, mouth open, eyes open, if it's smiling. And uh, the nice thing about it is that it's actually um, something you can uh, also adapt towards different resolutions. So uh, it doesn't really matter if a face is really far away or very close. And you can always just uh, um, yeah, divide it by the width of the screen. And this is really running in the real time. Um, the next step of the installation was the audio part, and, and this was where uh, the users has, are supposed to pre-read this very short text. Um, it takes about 20 seconds, and for the believable generation of audio, I would say I would need about eight seconds of, a video, of an audio. So the audio um, is again something that is happening within um, uh, Touch Designer and Flask, and it's using this real-time voice cloning. Um, also uh, an open source uh, method for synthesizing voices. And it was retrained as well uh, to be able to get a little bit uh, of, of, to recognize the differences between the different accents uh, because the project was based in Switzerland and the network is actually trained on the British and American speakers. So in the beginning, uh, the problem was that all of the different participants um, were speaking with a very native accent and that was not really uh, believable for them. Uh, so what is happening after recording and uh, the little text, there was a, mm, no, uh, the, I was running the FFMPG uh, uh, noise suppression algorithm and, and uh, like that I could enhance the audio a bit. So um, I was there around reflection, we did the links toward the perfection. The wish for a anyways, few days is going to work. work One second. Sorry, I think I over uh, did both of them. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so this was actually the, uh, maybe I just go back so you can see. I was there around um maybe i just get this away 
so I don't get the voice on that. Um, wait, I'm actually now uh, here. Um, so now the voice that you're going to see is already the synthesized audio. And how it was actually done as well, I was using this deep vocoder network. Um, so I just outputted the different uh, sentences in a text file. And uh, using Python again, it was just uh, reading through the text and uh, already synthesizing the, the audio um, based on the text that was inside of the file. Anyways, going to work doesn't make any difference. I wish I could do nothing and get paid for it. Um, so there was, this was already something that was happening after eight seconds of an audio. Uh, and it was about one to one uh, rendering time. So it took eight seconds to uh, output eight seconds of a, of a text. Um, I realized after working with this that um, it actually really makes sense to have about one minute of different audio in order to really produce something even more uh, similar to your own voice. And also, um, it actually works, I would say, much better with the male voices than with the female ones, and definitely with the deeper voices than in the high pitched ones. Uh, but still, it's really impressive uh, in terms of timing that you can achieve with that. Uh, so, in the end, what was just happening, I uh, took again the uh, uh, rendered deep fake, then the rendered audio, and in the end, um, outputted the, the deep fake. Uh, Anyways, going to work doesn't make any difference. Anyways, going to work doesn't make okay. any difference. Yes, so I wish it. I could do nothing and get paid for it. Um, so this was again another step that was happening with the FF uh, MPG. And the nice thing about it is that you can always say uh, that you want the audio uh, to be um, maybe shifted a little bit in time. Uh, so we don't really always have to match it uh, in the beginning uh, perfectly. Um, and the touch communication, communication, which is probably one of the most important parts uh, for you as well. Uh, so how was actually happening? So what was happening here? I had this little JSON file uh, with the different data, and I was uh, outputting it directly instead of a um, web that web client uh, node instead of a touch designer, uh, where it was basically communicating with this local network websites. And based on the different data entries, I could actually run uh, different codes and different nodes instead of Touch Designer. Um, so there was the um, there were the different uh, deep fakes that had to be preloaded on the run. Um, and the problem was actually sometimes that the deep fakes uh, were not on the server yet. Uh, so I had to actually really wait. And thanks to using the JSON, I could actually always output the files only when they were ready. Uh, so that's why in between, in between there was this little animation that was actually also adjusted depending on um, the amount of time that it took to the for the rendering of the deep fix. Sometimes the problem was that um, when the graphic card was running for too low, the, the rendering time slowed down, slowed down a little bit. Um, uh, so like that, uh, really just utilizing a lot of uh, web client, web data, I could uh, uh, synchronize whatever was happening on, on the side of the interface with uh, my touch designer network. Um, and uh, for the ones who are interested, uh, for now, those are closed and private repositories. But if you're interested in knowing how everything ru runs, you can uh, really mail me. Uh, or even afterwards inside of the room, I will be able to give you a link so you can actually download the repository and have a look at what's going on. It's still a, um, a research project now, that's why I cannot really make it public yet. Um, but I'm sure that at the beginning of next year, once the new version is on, uh, then I will be able to uh, also document it much better and uh, make it public and maybe even post it to the touch designer website so you can also have a look at how it does how it's done and how we can apply it towards your own projects um, that are also maybe heavily web-based so yeah thank you that was that was about it <laughs>